welcome to the Ask Historians podcast. Hello and welcome to the Ask Historians podcast. On this episode, we're interviewing Flared user, the big boss himself, on the topic of the 1974 Ethiopian revolution. Hello. Well, th thank you for having me. It's a great honor to be here. As a very, very brief introduction for those who know absolutely nothing about the topic, I mean, what are we going to be going over today? Well, today I've decided to discuss, the, as you mentioned, the revolution of, of 1974. Uh, the reason I chose this topic is because uh, um, a lot of the audience may not be really familiar with uh, modern Ethiopian history. It's not something that's routinely taught in most Western schools. So I feel like it will serve as an appropriate introduction uh, to the, this particular time period. Uh, and it, would, it will set the ground for future discussions on a more, I guess, more famous uh, event like the Red Terror or the Great Famine. But for now, we'll focus more on the background information. Then we'll move on to discuss the individual factors that contributed to the revolution. And finally, uh, we'll discuss uh, the actual revolution itself, going through it step by step. Let's sort of start by going with I mean, what was Ethiopia like before 1974, politically speaking? I mean, what was its governmental structure? Uh, who was in charge? And, and what was it doing in terms of its policy direction? Well, um, most people are probably familiar with the Solomonic dynasty. Uh, a few of its representatives uh, uh, have appeared in the news. There's Menelik, for example, and there's, there's of course, Emperor Haile Selassie I, who was the last representative of this dynasty. And the thing about this dynasty is that their actual power over the nation did fluctuate depending on what uh, uh, time period we're talking about. Uh, and uh, this power would consolidate under the rule of its last representative, uh, the famous Emperor Haile Selassie I. Now, he was a particularly interesting individual. Uh, a lot of mystique surrounded him. Uh, probably most famous was uh, back when Italy invaded Ethiopia during World War II. Um, he gave a famous speech uh, to the League of Nations, which still existed at the time. And later, when the Allies liberated Ethiopia, uh, he actually returned triumphantly and essentially became a symbol of Ethiopia. If you ask somebody uh, in the mid 20th century anything about Ethiopia, that's the guy. That they dimension because for an average American or European, he was the symbol and definition of Ethiopia. Uh, but one thing's for certain, he was very ambitious. Uh, when he was uh, crowned emperor, all the way back in the um, early 20th century, he set essentially three goals for himself. The first was to establish a modern uh, nation state out of the country's various ethnicities. The second uh, was to uh, create a security apparatus that would not only ensure the country's independence, but ensure his own authority. And number three, uh, establish total control over this uh, new nation. And to achieve this, he essentially had to strip the hereditary nobility, the so-called Masafent, uh, of their power and transform the country from a feudal state to a modernized central autocra centralized autocratic uh, regime. Uh, of course, this was particularly relevant after World War II because um, during World War II, a number of nobles actually defected to the Italian side. Uh, so it became more essential that he tried to limit their power, which was largely accomplished through uh, constitutional reforms. There are two constitutions written, written under his uh, reign and, and all of which passed various restrictions on what these nobles could and could not do. For example, they could no longer uh, make treaties with foreign powers. They could could not import weapons, uh, and they had to pledge loyalty to the crown. And as long as they did that, they still retained control over their land, as well as the peasants that uh, worked on the land, the, the tenants, because the tenancy system still dominated uh, Ethiopia. And through these policies, um, he was largely successful uh, when it comes to limiting their power. And as this nobility weakened, we would see the rise of a new elite, a more educated technocrats who started to assume a very high ranking government positions, including ministerial posts. And together with this new elite, uh, Emperor Haile Selassie would, would embark on a quest to modernize the nation and transform it into a country that was uh, more closer to mid 20th century you know, world and European standards at least. 
So uh, to focus on the socioeconomic situation, uh, the main goal of the emperor was to essentially insert the nation's economy into the global trade network. And uh, to accomplish this, uh, he started increasing the export of various cash crops and importing various luxury items. Uh, and as a result, trade did definitely grow in the country. And this was a major achievement of the administration. Uh, however, Yet it only accounted for somewhere around 7% of the country's GDP, and it was somewhat unfavorable to Ethiopia uh, because the price of export was uh, slowly uh, decreasing and the cost of import was increasing, and uh, the government wasn't making that much money from it. Uh, another issue was the industry. The country did start to industrialize, mostly in the capital and a few large, uh, a few large cities like Asmara. Uh, however, uh, most of this industry was uh, under the control of the of foreign businesses, and the government's share in these businesses rarely exceeded twenty percent. Uh, so, uh, in that sense, the government wasn't earning that much money from that either. Uh, when all said and done, uh, the entire country's uh, GDP was still largely based on agriculture. Something like over 90% of the population uh, were peasants who worked uh, in the countryside. Yet the government didn't seem to be that interested in uh, um, actually investing in the agricultural sector, uh, somewhat ignored this aspect of the economy, uh, which was a particularly problematic topic because uh, the farmers needed mechanized equipment, which they lacked. They needed fertilizer because the land uh, started, to have, started to lose its uh, fertility due to overuse. And there was still the issue of tenancy. Uh, so it was basically, I guess I don't want to use the term feudal, but uh, semi-feudal system uh, where basically uh, the peasant had to pay a portion of his produce to the landlord. And in some parts of the country, they had to pay additional taxes like a land tax. And as a result of this, of this system, not only did the lives of the peasants deteriorate, but their agricultural output could no longer meet the demands of the growing population. So many of these peasants started to uh, abandon their farms and move to the central cities where there were more jobs in the industrial sector and the service industry. Um, and these jobs were plentiful. However, the salaries were relatively low. And generally, when you have a large number of workers in a very small concentrated area and the salaries are pretty low, there's a good chance that there's going to be some labor agitation. People will start uh, call, asking for better salaries and better working conditions. And that's exactly what happened. Somewhere around the 60s, when the government actually allowed the formation of unions, you'd see a massive rise in various labor groups and trade associations. Most famous was uh, SELU, the Confederation of Ethiopian Labor Unions, which was established in 1962. And the government did view these uh, groups as a potential threat. However, they were too busy with uh, other issues at the time to uh, focus solely on them. What I what I'm gathering then is is that there's um, that there were clearly movements within what we might consider a, a coherent Ethiopian sort of state uh, that were potentially agitating for change. But it also <laughs> seems like Ethiopia was not just dealing with a coherent nation that was just sorting out you know, class conflicts and so on, that there was also some issue of, of ethnic separatism, um, particularly, as I understand it, at least in Eritrea in the north and Ogaden to um, the east. Uh, what was going on there specifically? Was was this, all, uh, how, how did this tie into what eventually became the revolution? Well, the thing about the separatists was that it was largely uh, a product of the colonial era. Eritrea was a colony of Italy, uh, and after World War II and the liberation of Eastern Africa, uh, the issue of uh, Eritrea and its future was raised at the Young United Nations. Uh, Ethiopia made territorial claims over uh, Eritrea because uh, they believed it was a historical part of the country. Um, but with some within Eritrea, mostly the Muslims of the population, although a handful of Christians uh, also uh, backed them. Uh, these groups uh, wanted independence. So what the United Nations did is that they settled on a compromise solution. Basically, they uh, decided to form a federation between Ethiopia and uh, Eritrea. And Eritrea, as a result of the system, would have its own uh, legislature, its own constitution and government, while Ethiopia would gain access to its uh, ports and uh, determine the budget and as well as and other issues. 
Uh, this sounds good on paper, but the main issue is that the government uh, had no uh, intention, the Ethiopian government, of actually honoring uh, this policy, mainly because from their perspective, uh, Ethiop Eritrea was a historical part of Ethiopia, and they should not be treated any differently from Tigray or Gondar or any other part of the country. So uh, what we would see is that throughout the 50s, uh, uh, the government would slowly dismantle this uh, system that the UN set up. Uh, and it would culminate in 1962 uh, when, together with the Unionist Party of Eritrea, which uh, at that time uh, dominated the Eritrean government and was pro-Ethiopian, uh, they would essentially dissolve the system altogether. And in 1962, Eritrea would become just another province of the country. This uh, logically would cause resentment among the Muslims of Ethiopia, uh, who would start to form uh, groups to fight against it. Uh, the main one being the Eritrean Liberation Front, which formed in the 60s uh, uh, during a period when, as I understand, there was a global rise in uh, pan-Arabist and pan-Islamist movements. So this um, ALF would receive a lot of support from the conservative Arab states in uh, Middle East and North Africa. And later in the 70s, we would see the rise of another rebel group, the Eritrean People's Liberation Front, uh, which would adopt a more Marxist-Leninist platform, and uh, they would start receiving support from the Eastern Bloc. But of course, these weren't the only rebel movements. You mentioned Oga, the Ogaden region. Uh, in the Ogaden, which is inhabited by the Somali people, uh, the Ogaden clan of the Somali people specifically, uh, we had the West Somali Liberation Front, uh, which was, as you can guess, funded by the Somali government, which at the time pursued a policy of pan-Somalism, uh, which essentially the idea that all Somali Somali-speaking people should live under a single nation. And that included the Ogaden people uh, as well. And besides this, we would have other rebel groups as well. For example, uh, the or Oromo rebels in the Bale region, which also received support from the uh, Somali government as a way to destabilize uh, Ethiopia. And the main consequence of all this uh, rebellion was that the large majority of the armed forces was pinned down in the peripheries, in distant parts of the country where there was virtually no infrastructure and lack of access to clean food and water. Uh, this caused resentment among the soldiers who were stationed there because they believed they genuinely deserved better treatment because from their perspective, they were the only things that keeping the country uh, together. Um, so it makes sense that the revolution, and we'll get to that later, would actually begin within the armed forces. One thing I'm, I guess, uh, listeners might be a little behind on at the moment is, is kind of the timeline of, of, of when all this is happening. How, when did the cracks really start to appear for, for Ethiopia's um, imperial government? Well, yes, the 1960 coup was the first demonstration that there was a crack, which even though uh, it happened two years before Eritrea was even dissolved. So you can see that other groups within the country were already interested in making change. Uh, the 1960 coup attempt essentially... Um, was largely inspired by the coup in Egypt uh, that a few years earlier brought Nasser to power, uh, and it was carried out by uh, a brigadier general named Mengistu Niwai, together with, with his brother, and they were largely interested in uh, fighting against the uh, apparent backwardness of uh, the country. They wanted to open more schools and factories, uh, but they made more, no mention of land reform, for example, so they were much less uh, radical than their Egyptian counterparts, uh, more populist. Uh, they didn't even plan to like, abolish the monarchy. They wanted to restructure it in their eyes. Uh, but uh, the reality is that this coup failed relatively quickly, uh, and most of its members were uh, executed or died in the uh, incident. Uh, however, it would have a tremendous impact on the civilian population, because it is often said that the coup uh, demystified the monarchy, essentially uh, stripped its stripped it from its almost divine status that it had. People realized that the monarchy could be subject to criticism and there were consequences to their actions. And one particular group that would be tremendously influenced by this um, a uh, coup attempt were the students of Ethiopia who would essentially start to portray themselves as the heirs of the 1960 rebels and uh, make their major goal for themselves to actually continue their legacy and continue the revolutionary effort. And that's why the student movement would uh, start to dominate uh, the, uh, I guess, the armed struggle of Ethiopia.
Mm. Uh, so what what was the history of that particular student movement? Because I mean, as with any such uh, 20th century revolution, I mean, I'm, uh, my point of reference is, is China in 1911. You know, there are so many forces coming together. Um, but I mean, students in this instance clearly, or at least from, from your description, clearly played a, a pretty outsized role. Uh, well, yes. Well, the rise of the student movement was largely a product of the fact that uh, a lot more Ethiopians could afford education. Um, we would see the rise of not only secondary schools, but also colleges and even uh, universities like Haile Selassie University in Addis Ababa. Uh, this was a big thing for Ethiopia because a large number of countries in Africa at the time, those that had recently gained independence, didn't really have tertiary educational institutions. So uh, Ethiopia was somewhat uh, ahead of its neighbors in this regard. Uh, so a lot of students had access to education now. And uh, by 1970, I believe something around uh, 70,000 students were enrolled in these uh, colleges and uh, secondary schools. But a lot of these institutions were run by uh, French Canadian Jesuit fathers uh, who had established them a few decades earlier. And they had, a, it is said that they had a somewhat authoritarian way of running things. Uh, and this initial student movement was initially an on-campus affair, uh, fighting against this authoritarian system, uh, demanding things like uh, better uh, conditions in, on the campuses, uh, more uh, freedom of speech and freedom of the press. But over the years, as the student body would become more diverse and more would come from a lower socioeconomic circles, uh, we would see that they would start to look at Ethiopian issues at the national level. Most, most importantly, they would start to look at the economy and just how much Ethiopia's economy was underdeveloped. Uh, one particular program that emphasized this was the 1964 Ethiopian government program that encouraged students to go to the countryside uh, to work as teachers, essentially. And they got to see with their own eyes just how much the government government had uh, ignored essentially the rural parts of the uh, country. So uh, in response, many of these students would start to embrace Marxist-Leninism Marxist -Leninism, uh, because they focused on its um, uh, alleged equality-oriented and modernizing program. Uh, they believed that if they followed the models of Russia and China, Ethiopia would transform into a modernized socialist state in a matter of years. Of course, many of these students didn't have a complete understanding of how these countries actually got where they were at the time, uh, but uh, nonetheless, they were still very fascinated by uh, Marxism, and many would adopt uh, pretty anti-Western views, largely because they would associate uh, the Ethiopian monarchy with the United States, because those two had close ties at the time, largely as a result of uh, Cold War policies, and uh, they wanted to uh, reject anything re related to the West, including Western capitalism. Uh, of course, the government would view this student movement as a threat, and they would take action by either assassinating some of its leadership or by restricting demonstrations. Yet the movement would uh, slowly grow over time and would reach uh, the levels that it would start to um, not only take a major role in the revolution, but they would start to influence the ideology of those involved uh, within it. Now, Ethiopia I think in, in popular consciousness, is, is well known as the African country of which in the late 20th century suffered particularly well-known famines. Uh, did uh, When did famine and other food shortages really start coming in, and, and did those contribute to 1974? Yes, um, famine in Ethiopia have become synonymous in a sense, unfortunately, especially with recent news. Uh, but one particular famine that happened around the time of the revolution was the Wall of Famine, which was largely the product of the fact that there was a series of droughts that led to the failure of the 1973 harvest. And as a result, there were major food shortages. Uh, the government's main problem was that uh, they ignored a lot of the warning calls that came both within and outside the country that there was going 
going to be a major humanitarian crisis. Uh, however, uh, not only did they ignore these warning calls, but when the famine actually set in, uh, they started to essentially downplay the seriousness of the situation, which did uh, impact the relief efforts. And the end result is that over 100,000 people would end up dying. Um, as for the impact it had on the revolution, that's more difficult to establish because most of the people who were affected by the famine were the peasantry in the countryside. And uh, the revolution was largely an urban affair, so it's hard to draw direct connections. But one thing's for certain, the famine did um, discredit the monarchy in the eyes of the students as well as intellectuals. There was a famous BBC documentary, The Unknown Famine, that was released around the time, and those who got to see it just realized how much uh, the government was ignoring uh, the countryside. So uh, later, when the revolution started to uh, begin, a lot of these students would portray uh, the famine as largely man-made to further discredit the imperial regime's uh, moral authority, in a sense. Uh, and later, when the Derg, the future government, came to power, one of their main the goals essentially was to increase humanitarian aid to drought affected areas. Uh, but of course, as we know, that was not the only famine Ethiopia would see in the 20th century or even in the 21st century, unfortunately, of course. Yeah, no, it does. It does sound like things are really coming to a head now. Um, I, I mentioned earlier uh, 1911 in China, which is, is apposite here because again, it's it's a mutiny that's that starts it, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yes, that's the famous uh, aspect that the revolution did not begin in the countryside as some uh, assumed it would. It began within the armed forces. It was a fairly small mutiny. In fact, there is a very, very tiny village uh, called Negele, and the 24th Brigade was stationed there. And uh, on January 12, 1974, they mutinied, allegedly as a response to the fact that they were not allowed to use a local well. Uh, and the food shortage, water shortages were a major problem at the time, so they decided to mutiny and called for better living conditions as well as better salaries. Uh, the government sent um, a general to negotiate with them. However, he was quickly arrested on arrival, uh, mainly because the mutineers wanted to see a higher-ranking official. Uh, so, um, in the end, the emperor himself ended up sending a letter uh, to uh, the um, uh, to these mutineers promising to meet their demands. So uh, they felt satisfied and uh, they released the imprisoned general who was immediately sent to another mutiny that was happening in Dolo and there they also promised uh, to meet their demands. So these two mutinies ended uh, without uh, most of the civilian population even uh, finding out about their existence. Uh, uh, however, it would have a tremendous impact on the armed forces of Ethiopia. Uh, essentially, as word would spread around and uh, many soldiers started to realize that they had a lot more bargaining power than they initially assumed. So we would see the rise of these uh, special coordinating committees, which were essentially a group of soldiers uh, discussing what problems they faced and what uh, demands they had to make uh, from the government. Uh, and initially this was limited to the interests of the soldiers themselves and their living conditions. And only later when the civilian population would get involved did we see uh, the revolution take on a more national character. So we've got very clearly both opposition within the military and opposition from the civilian population in their own right. How? How did these responses manifest um, in the coming days, weeks, months um, after the initial mutiny? Uh, well, um Around the time after the mutiny happened, Ethiopia would be hit by the largest uh, civilian uprising in its history. Uh, but the causes of it were somewhat external to the government. Uh, basically, in the, in the aftermath of the Yom Kippur War, um, we know the famous OPEC embargo happened, uh, and Ethiopia was forced to buy oil at three times the original price. And to make up for it, they started to uh, sell uh, fuel at 50 percent higher at a 50 percent higher cost uh, which was uh, particularly bad news if you were a taxi driver in Addis Abeba because your entire livelihood essentially depended on the exact uh, cost of uh, fuel so they decided to take action and uh, shortly after these mutinies around a month later on February 18th they decided to um, go on strike and uh, decide to protest as well uh, however uh, 
they, they, they weren't the only people protesting at, on the same day. We would also have uh, involvement of the Ethiopian Teachers Association, who at this point were calling for salaries, uh, salary increases for over six years now. Uh, however, that's not why they mutinied. Basically, two months earlier, uh, the government passed uh, an educational reform program called the Sector Review, which essentially made education mandatory only until the fourth grade. And after that, children in theory could pretend could pursue vocational training. However, the uh, Teachers Association was very critical of this decision because they believed that uh, this would ensure that only the wealthy could afford secondary and tertiary education because only they could send uh, their kids to uh, private schools. So they decided to take action. When they discovered that the taxi drivers were planning protests, uh, they uh, decided to join in and on the exact same day, uh, they went on strike. And of course, we also had the students of Ethiopia who obviously needed no reason to protest. At this point, they were very used to uh, protesting. So they poured onto the streets, uh, chanting revolutionary slogans as they usually did. Uh, the government's initial response was obviously suppression. And I think over 500 taxi drivers were arrested in the uh, next three days. But uh, eventually, they would start to give in. On, on February 21st, uh, the emperor himself gave a speech on radio announcing that the sector review had been suspended. Uh, in addition, he promised salary increases and a reduction in the price of fuel. Um, however, later we find out that uh, the cost of uh, petrol was reduced by uh, 10 cents, uh, even though uh, the government had raised it a few weeks earlier by 25 cents. So uh, for many, it was seen as largely inadequate, especially for the soldiers, because the salary increase that actually came were only like $9, which was very inadequate for Ethiopian soldiers at the time, considering the conditions they lived in and constantly being under the threat of a rebel ambush. So uh, while the civilian uprising uh, started to uh, somewhat uh, wither down, we would see the military take a further action as they felt dissatisfied with the government response. The situation here does sound like one in which uh, the, the imperial monarchy is providing what seem to be very, very limited concessions under the circumstances. I mean, before we get into the continuation of the mutiny, just as a slight aside, I mean, was there any way they could have done better? Uh, well, that's a good question because, I mean, uh, as mentioned, the price of uh, oil had increased. So there was a there was a really difficult, no effective way for them to actually um, respond to it without raising, raising the cost of fuel. Um, I mean, a lot of nations were affected by the OPEX embargo at the time. But uh, a few concessions that could have been made uh, were at least democratic reforms, which were something that didn't really require much investment. And they could have achieved the uh, by making only a few minor adjustments. For example, uh, the Ethiopian constitution did uh, have an elected, allow ele an elected legislature, the parliament of Ethiopia with two chambers. Uh, and the lower chamber was um, actually directly elected after the 1955 constitution. But the main problem is that there were no political parties. So the if had the government simply allowed uh, political parties to form, it would make it easier for people to actually unite under uh, certain issues and essentially campaign on these issues, which would have made it more likely that uh, the government would address uh, some of these, uh, some of the problems that the country faced. And of course, there was also um, civil liberties, which were suppressed in the country at the time. Again, the students were largely calling for civil, liber civil liberties in the beginning. So uh, had they simply followed, uh, the, the major criticism is that had they simply followed what the constitution actually said that they uh, guaranteed, like the freedom of speech, uh, then things may have turned out uh, differently. Yeah, but what they could have done, they still didn't do. So clearly, the, uh, was what came next? I mean, was there a further escalation in civilian protests? Um, or, or did the army then take the next step? Well, the next step was indeed taken by the military uh, because, again, the main issue was the lack of uh, proper salary increases. So uh, what happened is that uh, 
uh, around the, uh, the second division actually sees the radio station and publicly broadcast that these salary increases were inadequate, which motivated a lot of soldiers to get together and essentially go to the government and see the emperor himself and ask uh, and ask him for a number of reforms. At this point, we would see that the military wasn't just focused on themselves anymore. They were starting to be influenced by uh, what the civilians were asking for. Uh, for example, they called for land reform, which was a major issue, democratization, uh, as well as better employee-employer uh, relationships, as well as price control. Uh, so um, surprisingly, the emperor did uh, concede and accept uh, these requests. He even had the existing cabinet dismissed, uh, and he was, and the cabinet was replaced with a new one, uh, which was led by the new prime minister, Endel Gachiu uh, Magonen, who was a member of the old of the old technocrats, but he was a, a very smart individual, realizing that a lot of action had to be done to essentially uh, end this uh, uprising. So he started to work on a draft constitution that would uh, transform the country in into an actual constitutional monarchy. You know, a directly elected uh, government body uh, that would. Uh, control the government and the monarchy would be uh, had a more civil, more, more ceremonial role, just like, I guess, Britain could be an example of that, and more guarantees of civil liberties. So uh, you could argue that the government genuinely tried to, uh, to um, actually make changes, genuine changes, although critics argued that this even this new constitution uh, would uh, essentially ensure that uh, the aristocrats, the elite especially, would maintain uh, power, although uh, the supporters argued that that this was a genuine attempt at uh, change. Although one thing's for certain is that uh, the military did feel satisfied with these uh, um, changes, and most of them kind of went back to uh, their military bases. However, the civilian population, the radical wing particularly, uh, would feel uh, that uh, there was not enough, and they would uh, pick up where the uh, military left off, essentially. Was was there friction between the civilian and military elements of what was what eventually would become the revolution? I mean, did, did they did they generally see eye to eye? Were they willing to put aside differences in pursuit of a common goal, or, or were we actually seeing two quite different kinds of opposition forming? Well, the thing is, um, there was a general distrust uh, from the radicals, especially the radical students of the military, because many of them were directly associated uh, with the imperial regime. Uh, however, they realized that they need to cooperate in a certain, at a certain level, uh, because no one side would be enough to essentially take down uh, the government. However, uh, these radical students did accuse the military of only caring about their uh, salaries, essentially. Uh, so. So uh, they started to um, take further actions uh, by increasing the number of strikes going on in the country. Uh, for example, we would see the uh, rise, the CELU, the, the mentioned uh, Confederation of Ethiopian Labor Unions, uh, organizing a major strike, and uh, along with the tobacco monopoly, uh, the workers of the tobacco monopoly and the Civil Aviation Authority, all of these organizations would go on strike, including various religious groups like the Muslims of Ethiopia who felt discriminated and the members of the Ethiopian Orthodox Church, mostly the workers of the church themselves, uh, who went on strike largely due to uh, salary, uh, salary issues. Uh, and the government uh, responded to this new wave of protests uh, with a more cautious approach. They were basically worried that the military would get involved and directly side with the civilians, so uh, they took a more graduate, gradual level of suppression, essentially slowly arresting the people involved. Uh, although even this slow approach did start to have an effect, and eventually uh, by June or so of 1974, uh, the urban uprising would uh, start to thaw in a sense. And the main question re remained, what was the military going to do? Uh, were they going to intervene? Or were they going to let uh, the government deal with the civilian protests by themselves? What comes next? We've got you know, these emerging civilian protests. Typically, when you get a, a sort of coup situation, it is the people with the guns doing it. So, so how do we get from there to the military taking more action? Mm -hmm. 
Well, uh, the reason the military didn't directly take action during these civilian protests was that at this point they were kind of split between two uh, groups. One were one was a group of coordinating committees that essentially supported the status quo and backed uh, the cabinet of Angel Gachu and the draft constitution. And there were uh, then uh, there was another group, the more radicals, uh, and their coordinating committees. Who, excuse me, uh, wanted uh, more change. Uh, so um, these two groups didn't really see eye to eye, um, particularly on the issue of uh, prosecuting uh, former members uh, of the cabinet who were accused of corruption. And when these radicals realized that um, the government wasn't really planning on um, actually prosecuting anybody, uh, they decided to take action on their own and uh, even arrested the former prime minister, Aguilo. Uh, and this also led to another wave of mutinies. But the difference is that this time uh, the government realized uh, that it wasn't the entire military that was the problem. It was a, a small group within the armed forces. So they decided to take action against this particular group by basically uh, either banishing them or sending them to uh, remote locations. Uh, although a few did manage to avoid these banishments, um, which included uh, major players in the revolution, like uh, Major uh, Atnafu Abate of the 4th Division and Major Defera of the Army Engineers, uh, these two groups essentially realized that uh, they needed to form a new coordinating committee, one that would represent not just a single unit, but the entire armed forces, as well as the Navy and the uh, police force. So uh, first they need to build strength, because at this point, Again, there was not really a major civilian uprising anymore. It had been somewhat suppressed. So they need to find another source of support, uh, which and they turned their attention to the veterans of Ethiopia, uh, many of whom had served on UN missions in Korea and uh, the Congo. Uh, and at this time, um, they were the radicals uh, told these veterans that the, uh, the government of Ethiopia essentially stole a portion of their salaries that the UN set aside for them. Uh, so... Um, this obviously caused a lot of problems among these uh, veterans and they went to the government for answers. But when they did not get a satisfactory response, they went to the uh, radicals for help, which essentially allowed them to grow in strength and uh, tilt the balance of power in, in the favor of these radicals. So at this point, and we're talking about summer, early summer at this point, uh, the, these uh, Atnafu felt that um, they were ready to form this coordinating committee. So they sent a number of telegrams uh, to various um, um, units within the armed forces and asked them to delegate three representatives each for a meeting that was chaired by uh, Atnafu. Uh, and uh, on this meeting, which was held on June 28th, uh, they announced the formation of the Coordinating Committee of the Armed Forces, the Territorial Army, and the DERG, which is a mouthful, but it was more commonly referred to as the DERG. Now, the word Derg itself is quite interesting because it's not Amharic. Uh, it is actually from ancient Ethiopian, the famous Gez uh, language, uh, which at this point most Ethiopians did not speak. It was uh, the language of the Ethiopian Orthodox Church, but outside of that you'd rarely hear it. Uh, but the word itself meant committee. So uh, the um, armed forces chose this term because they wanted to appeal to the nationalism of the Ethiopian people by adopting these ancient uh, terminologies. I guess some would compare it to, I guess, if um, the British government somehow started using Anglo-Saxon terminology, I guess. Uh, but either way, uh, this uh, new uh, derg existed and the word itself would become synonymous with the regime that would uh, take power uh, after the revolution, uh, the derg regime of Ethiopia. I often hear about it in the news. Um, and uh, the first issue that this new uh, committee had to face was the issue of leadership. Uh, eventually, they settled on appointing uh, Mengistu Haile Mariam, the future dictator of Ethiopia, as its chairman, who came from the third division, and Adnafu became the vice chairman. And once they, and this was a temporary measure, by the way, because um, they ended up electing a new leadership somewhere in September after uh, the revolution was finalized. Uh, but at this point, the leadership crisis was uh, over, and they could finally turn their attention to uh, the government itself. And well, clearly, 
clearly they did. And and I mean, how how dramatic were the events that followed? I mean, was was the plan? For, oh yeah, well, was what was the plan? <laughs> Do we know? Um, how far did things go to plan? Um, and was was the idea to very rapidly topple the government or to um, cause a number of, of radical changes where there was some prospect that some elements of the government might still survive? Well, the thing is, the 1974 revolution is sometimes described as a coup. But the thing about coups is that they're usually associated with rapid change. But that's not, not exactly what happened with Ethiopia. In fact, the, a common term used to refer to the process that happened is uh, the creeping coup, uh, because uh, the Derg would slowly amass power while... Uh, being relatively hidden from the population. Not that many people knew about their existence, but behind the scenes, they worked to slowly dismantle the new regime. Uh, but the first thing they did was they published their uh, program, uh, their ideology, essentially, called Ethiopia First, Ethiopia Tigdem is, is the official term, which was more broadly patriotic than anything else, nothing too radical, including things like um, speedy implementation of the draft constitution, um, better employee employer relationships, uh, land reform, uh, all these issues that the country, the entire country was essentially calling for, as well as, for example, humanitarian aid delivery to uh, drought affected areas because we mentioned the wall of famine at this point. Uh, so um, at this point, they still pledged loyalty to the crown, which is an important point. They were very careful to avoid uh, ac actually accusing the emperor of any wrongdoing because they did not know what uh, how the civilians would respond to it. So uh, they instead uh, turned their attention to the actual cabinet. On June 29th, they actually went uh, to uh, this cabinet and asked them to form a joint committee to help them complete the uh, constitution that they were working on. Of course, the committee was, the cabinet was reluctant to actually relinquish and share power. So, uh, on June 29th, um, they went to the emperor himself, who surprisingly agreed to the Derg's request. It's not exactly clear why uh, the emperor agreed. Uh, the main uh, theory is that uh, he genuinely believed that the Derg was on his side, that they were only interested in uh, uh, prosecuting a, a number of corrupt officials and uh, if he simply let the Dirk do what they wanted, uh, he would emerge from the crisis as powerful as ever before. Uh, so essentially he allowed the joint committee to be formed, which essentially um, allowed the Dirk itself to uh, take action against those who were not willing to work for them. Uh, for example, first they dismissed the Minister of Defense, and then uh, on, in July, I believe, uh, they didn't replace the Prime Minister, and El Kachu was replaced with uh, a guy named Mikhail Imiro, uh, who was actually a relative of the emperor, if I remember correctly, uh, but he was known for uh, some of his left-leaning views and a more he was more critical of the imperial policies, uh, which arguably ended up saving his life because he was the only member of the former government that was not killed uh, later in uh, the November massacre. Uh, so Either way, uh, through these uh, changes in government, the Derg managed to take total control over the parliament of Ethiopia. Uh, however, uh, there was still one last obstacle remaining to total control, and that was the emperor himself. But, as mentioned, they were reluctant to t take action against him because uh, they felt that at least a portion of the population would uh, not uh, accept such a change of overthrowing the emperor. So they decided to take things slowly. Basically, they slowly peeled away the emperor's power. Uh, first, they um, uh, dissolved some of the crown institutions like the Ministry of Penn, and then they started to nationalize some of the crown-owned businesses like the bus transport company and St. George's Brewery. Um, it was alleged that the brewery brought in millions of dollars to the royal family, although it was later revealed that this wasn't exactly a government-owned enterprise. In fact, the government's share in the brewery was only 2%. Uh, 
Uh, so the actual results of this nationalization is questionable. Uh, but one thing for certain is that uh, the population didn't seem to mind uh, these changes, uh, which, which made the Derg realize that uh, not much would happen if they took more radical changes and the population would not uh, have a negative response. So they decided to take things a step further by starting a propaganda campaign against the uh, emperor. In fact, uh, on September 11th, which is, I believe, New Year's in Ethiopia, uh, they broadcast that documentary I mentioned a few minutes earlier uh, that depicted uh, images uh, of the wall of famine that were juxtaposed with images of the emperor's luxurious lifestyle, you know, things like uh, balls or um, there was a scene of the emperor feeding uh, his dogs from a silver plate, uh, which really infuriated the population when they saw these um, these videos and, uh, and the emperor lost what little respect he had uh, among the population. So at this point, the Derg felt that they were ready to make the final decision. And on September 12th, 1974, uh, they announced proclamations one and two, uh, which did three things. It uh, dissolved the parliament, suspended the existing constitution, and most importantly, it deposed uh, the emperor. Uh, the emperor. Uh, emperor Haile Selassie uh, was put inside a car and sent away to a remote location as an angry mob uh, shouted at him. Uh, and with that, the Solomonic dynasty came to an end, um, and the Derg were now the sole rural, rulers of the country, although they had a lot more to do um, in, in, when it comes to dealing with a very radicalized population that uh, wanted a very rapid change, essentially. You know, so we, um, while we come to the conclusion of, of the chronological elements of, of the the revolution insofar as it meant toppling the old government. I mean, there are a couple of, of things that stand out to me um, that we may as well finish off as a final coda. One question that I had is it regards the Derg, because you, you know, the Derg later you know, gets famous for the Red Terror, and that sort of implies a, a, a declared set of, of left-wing priorities. I mean, when, how did the Derg end up taking on a specifically leftist character, because the impression I get, so far at least, is that what had characterized um, the military response to the to the monarchy, monarchical government leading up to the revolution um, was largely focused simply on the internal welfare of, of the military itself. Yes, you're right that the initial coordinating committees were largely focused on uh, the affairs of the soldiers themselves, and only later you would take on uh, interests like uh, land reform that the population was uh, demanding. Although it would be inaccurate to say that uh, the military was solely uh, unfamiliar with Marxism or left or left wing ideology, this essentially depended on uh, where you came from, where did you, where you had your education. For example, uh, if uh, a person particular officer received their education at um, Haile Selassie Military Academy, um, which provided tertiary education, uh, they had uh, better access to um, not only a better education, but also uh, to the student movement of Ethiopia. Uh, who also had a presence there as well. And the way the student movement worked is that uh, even if you did not uh, support Marxism, uh, it was so popular among the students that there was a social pressure to actually familiar, familiarize yourself with it, read, up, read upon it a little. So at least some of the officials who graduated from this academy uh, were at least familiar with the basics of Marxism. Although this does not necessarily mean that they um, supported it or wanted to adopt it, um, because the actual process of the Derg adopting Marxist-Leninism uh, as its main platform was a, a much a slower process that largely would uh, happen after the revolution. We would go from Ethiopia first policy to um, Ethiopian socialism, which was like um, a borderline between nationalism and true Marxism. And later we would see full adoption of uh, Marxist-Leninism. And this was largely the product of the fact that uh, a large part of the civilian population was very radicalized. And there were a lot of left-wing movements at the time 
that uh, considered themselves to be the vanguards of this new revolution. To essen so essentially, as a way to compete with them, uh, they adopted left wing uh, a left wing ideology on, on their own part uh, and would become. I would I depict themselves as uh, the vanguard and the leaders of this new uh, Marxist level revolution. And what became of Selassie? I mean, there's kind of two elements of this, really. I mean, what what happened to him personally after 1974? But also, I mean, Selassie is notable in part also for his his status as, as a religious figure in Rastafarianism. And so I'm curious, not just about his his life after 74, but also his legacy. How has opinion about Selassie, particularly in Ethiopia, changed over time? Uh, well, uh, the end story of uh, the emperor is not exactly very happy a happy one uh, because by the time of the revolution he was over eighty, so uh, he would spend the remaining uh, months of his life uh, under Dirk's imprisonment. Um, Around 1975, August, it was announced uh, that the emperor died of uh, complications related to a prostate surgery, which I understand is somewhat um, unique considering the exact moment we're talking about with Prince, with the current British monarchy. But um, uh, essentially, uh, the official announcement was that he died because of these complications and it was a completely natural process. However, it was later revealed that uh, the operation actually happened a few months earlier than the Dirk announced uh, and he was apparently feeling relatively well in the days preceding uh, his death. So there were a lot of rumors that his death was in not, not in fact natural. Uh, later, when the Derg was overthrown, a, a number of documents would resurface uh, that would allege uh, that the emperor was actually strangled in his sleep uh, on the orders of Mengistu Haile Mariam, who at this point was slowly amassing power and was on his path to dictatorship. Uh, so... Um, uh, it, he believed essentially that as long as the emperor was alive, uh, he would uh, still there would still be a risk that some some of his supporters would rise up against this new government. So he wanted to take action to permanently end this uh, possibility. And when it comes to the legacy of Haile Selassie, it's still highly controversial uh, because. Uh, depends on who you're talking to. I mean, the Derg is almost universally hated uh, in Ethiopia uh, because of the Red Terror and the uh, Great Famine. So uh, the vast majority probably do not view the new government as political, but as a positively, but um, that doesn't mean that the Haile Selassie's legacy was necessarily positive either. There are a few, of course, the Rastafarian movement in the Caribbean that essentially depict, depict him as a sort of messiah, and there was, I believe, controversy uh, whether or not he actually died uh, during, in 1975, and whether or not a messiah could die. Uh, so, as for the rest of the population, mostly within Ethiopia, I guess the best way to describe him as a flawed individual. Uh, some are, there are critics who said that he basically had dementia and he could not run the government. Although others say that he was old and he simply did not have the energy uh, to uh, actually deal with the major crisis that the country was facing at the time. And of course, if you were an Oromo or an Eritrean, your uh, views on the emperor would be much more negative. But overall, his legacy is somewhat controversial and would re will remain probably controversial uh, for the next uh, a few years, at least. Right, I mean, that seems like a place to, to round this all out. Obviously, Ethiopian history doesn't end in 1975, but, you know, this podcast has to somewhere. Mm -hmm, so yeah. thank you very much for coming on. Yeah, this was a great experience. I hope it's not my only time participating no, I'm sure it won't be. But uh, that will nevertheless be another time than this. So, once again, thank you for being on, and thank you for listening. You've been listening to the Ask Historians podcast. Please support us at patreon.com slash askhistorians. Find more history like this by following us on Twitter and Facebook, and by visiting us at askhistorians.reddit.com and ask hundreds of historians and enthusiasts anything you want to know about history.